Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Cynthia, and I help direct the events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 91 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome Adam Rutherford for the launch of his latest book, Humanimal. Adam is the author of A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Nonfiction, and Creation, which was shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize. He writes and presents BBC's flagship weekly Radio 4 program, Inside Science, The Cell for BBC4, and Playing God on the Rise for Synthetic Biology for leading science series, Horizon, in addition to writing for The Guardian. Please join me in welcoming Adam to Strand. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, thank you for inviting me to New York, my first time in 10 years. I got off the plane about an hour and a half ago, so forgive me if I'm a bit scratchy. Um, so yeah, this is my, the, the, the new book, Humanimal, which is a, it's kind of like a sequel to the last book I wrote, which was called A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived. I'm a geneticist and evolutionary biologist. And so in that book, in A Brief History, I sort of covered about a million years worth of human evolution using DNA as, our, as the source text, as a historical source, to try and understand the journey of how we got from there to here. So that was a million years of human history. And, and in this book, in Humanimal, um, I'm dealing with really only the last 100,000 years of human history, so I'm you know, really narrowing down my focus. Uh, and it's, it's really a book about the sort of fundamental question of what makes us human. So a, a question that humans have been obsessed with for, well, for the whole of history, but I think never really coming up with a satisfactory answer. And a lot has been made of, of talking about things like language and tools and communication and speech. Um, so I'm, I'm going to cover all of those things. There's a, about half of the book is about, uh, is about sex. Um, and I didn't really plan to write a book about weird animal sex and equivalent um, human weird sex. I guess it's really appropriate that we're right next to the erotica department. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about that here right now. Um, you just have to buy the book if you want the weird animal sex. Or just look at the erotica section. But I will be talking about tools and fire and communication and art. So it's appropriate that we're in the art section of, of Strand Bookshop here. Um, one of the things that I really try to do in all of my work is to uh, embrace the complexity and the sophistication of evolution and, and, and avoid very singular narratives that, that, where we talk about one thing, so uniqueness theories, where over the years people have suggested a whole bunch of stuff where this was the singular trigger. This is the thing that turned us in from, an, from a, an earlier ape to the ape that we are now. And so it's things like people have suggested language or speech or fire. I'll talk a bit about fire in a minute. Um, even people have suggested recently, in the last couple of years, that taking hallucinogenic drugs was the thing that turned us from being into the thing that we are now from an earlier ape. I don't think any of those uniqueness theories work because although some of them, aspects of them in anthropology and in genetics and in human evolution may be true, they don't describe the richness or the complexity of human evolution at all. And so I want to embrace that complexity and celebrate it because that, that is how evolution is, that is how reality is. The, the really simplistic answer to the question what makes us human is, um, is really boring. It's having two human parents and having a human genome. But that doesn't go any way to answering the question about the human condition, which is fundamentally what we're interested in. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about here. The, the, the subtitle, How Homo Sapiens Became Nature's Most Paradoxical Creature. The paradox in there works at a, a, a number of levels for us. And first really described scientifically by my hero, Charles Darwin, uh, where he talks in 1871 uh, in The Descent of Man, his second best book, uh, about, well, this amazing quote. Darwin was a great writer, but, you know, the best scientific writer, I think, of all time and happened to come up with the best idea of all time, which was evolution by natural selection. But when he applied it to humans, he identified this paradox, which is that we are evolved beings. We, are, we, we now know we have the same DNA, the same cell structure, uh, the same basic biology, biological mechanisms, uh, as every creature that has ever existed, and yet we have godlike intellects, which has penetrated into the movements of the solar system. But there it is at the bottom, in 
19th century Victorian language, he says, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. A better writer than Darwin, and there aren't many, said exactly the same thing about 250 years earlier in the soliloquy from, from Hamlet. You know, what this, this amazing speech, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason. So there was a point where I wanted to call the book The Paragon of Animals, but my editor said that was too pretentious, um, and he's probably right about that. Um, but it, it's exactly the same sentiment. We are an animal, we are evolved, we have these amazing abilities. It goes on after, Hamlet says after saying Paragon of Animals, he says, but what is this quintessence of dust, right? So we have all these amazing abilities in action, how like an angel, in apprehension like a god, but at the same time, we are merely matter. And, and there is, again, that same paradox, that same paradox of trying to understand from a scientific point of view, the human condition. Now, I write, I, I love films, and in all of my work, I hide quotes from films that I like, mostly for my own amusement. But in, at the end of A Brief History, I'd written a, a line, and um, my, I, I didn't realize it was a quote from a film because it's so embedded into my psyche. But it, the quote was this, and it says approximately the same thing. Everyone is special, which is another way of saying that nobody is. And I wrote that, and my editor wrote back and said, um, I like the way you included the line from that film in it. Who knows what film that's from? It's from The Incredibles. Yes, that's right. So in the first three pages of this book, I quote Darwin, uh, Shakespeare, and Dash from The Incredibles. It's all saying exactly the same thing. The paradox of humankind is that we are both special and unique, uh, and at the same time, we are biological and on the same tree of life as everything else. So, the story of human evolution has, has undergone a, a revolution in the last 10 years, mostly because of the introduction of genetics into paleoanthropology. So the ability to extract DNA from old bones and retell the stories of human evolution. So I'm just going to recap uh, the last well, a million years or so. This is a standard tree of life. So on, on the left here, we have a million years ago. And on the right, we have uh, today. The bottom set of homo sapiens there is, um, is us today, extant living homo sapiens divided up into three major land groups, Asian, Europeans, and Africans. Now, we know that about 120,000 years ago, an earlier branch of homo sapiens left Africa. Uh, and we refer to them as archaic modern humans. They leave no descendants today. They made it as far as Eurasia, but, um, but, but didn't, didn't continue into the modern era. You guys know about uh, the Neanderthals. We now divide them into Eastern and Western Neanderthals. Neanderthals were primarily a European species of human. We call everything within the genus Homo uh, a human. Uh, but the more we look, the more we find they were also, they, they definitely branched out into Asia, and I expect that will increase as we continue to look. And then you might remember that about 2009, 2010, a, a single finger bone from the little finger of a teenage girl and a single tooth, a molar, was found in a cave in Siberia. The cave was called um, Denisova. And although that's not enough physical remains to, uh, to determine what, what species that human was, we did manage to get the DNA, the full genome, out of that finger bone. And when you compare it to the genome of the Neanderthals, which had been sequenced a year earlier, and the genome of us today, it wasn't the same. We don't designate species by, by genomes, so we can't say it's a different species. But it was significantly different enough to say, this is a human, but it's different from Neanderthals, and it's different from us. So that's a traditional form of the, of the tree of life, updated with the new discoveries of the last few years. But as I was saying at the beginning, I, I, I'm of the mind that now that we have genetics as part of uh, understanding evolution, understanding human evolution, we can't really use the metaphor of a tree anymore. Because what we know from looking at the genetics of all of these species, including us, is that actually there's tons of interbreeding between what we traditionally would have regarded as separate species. So in, in genetics is, is basically the study of sex and families. Um, and so we have a ton of euphemisms, but you can work out what they mean. So we talk about gene flow events. You know what a gene flow event is? Yes, you do. Right. So there are gene flow events between uh, almost all of these branches. So we now know that the Western Neanderthals interbred with the people who had become uh, who left Africa and would, would populate the world as Asians and Europeans. We also know that the Western Neanderthals had gene flow events with Europeans, and just looking around this room, most of the people in this room will have around about 1% to 1.5% Neanderthal DNA, and that's evidence for gene flow events 
Um, we also know that the eastern Neanderthals interbred with the archaic modern humans, although both of those species leave no descendants today. Uh, and then we know that the Denisovans interbred with the eastern Neanderthals and the Denisovans interbred with the Asians. And so where we, uh, people of European descent, have something like 1 to 1.5% 1 uh, Neanderthal DNA, the further east you go, the further into Asia you go, the more Denisovan DNA you see in there. So I, I don't know what the right word to describe this is, but it, it isn't a tree, right? It's like a tangled thicket. And, and you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned this top branch here. So this is a piece of science which I think is so incredible uh, and enabled by genetics that it's, it's, it's almost magical. But basically, um, when you compare the genomes of all of these, these ones down the bottom from the Denisemans down to us, they don't quite add up. When you compare them all together, they don't quite add up. There appears to be an introgression, a gene flow event between the, this top branch into the Denisovans which makes up for this, the fact that they don't quite match up. We don't know who that species was. We don't have bones for them. We just know that they must exist because we can see their genetic signature in the genomes of the Denisovans. Okay? So this is where we're at in terms of the genetics of species. Now, the, the, the conundrum, the paradox that is in the subtitle, which is the sort of central theme of the book, is that, right, this is the oldest member of our species, Homo sapiens. This is... Uh, uh, um, found in Morocco in the 1960s, but redated in 2017. And it dates around 300 to 315,000 years ago. So that moves the earliest humans, Homo sapiens, from, uh, from East Africa, the Rift Valley, to North Africa, and it moves the date back about 100,000 years. Now, the point about this guy and the other members of this, of, of this, um, of this dig in Jebel Arud in Morocco is that if we were to find someone like this and give them a haircut, put them in a suit or a dress, give them a shave, and sit them on the subway, you wouldn't be able to see them. You wouldn't be able to spot them as being different. Physically, and in fact, genetically, they are basically indistinguishable from us today. Okay, so we have been approximately the same in terms of our physical and genetic characteristics for at least a quarter of a million years. But something does happen. Something significant happens within the last 100,000 years and definitely within the last 50,000 years because by 40,000 years ago, we're producing things like this. So this, is, this was the earliest piece of figurative art known. It's called the Lovenmensch of Hollenstein Stadel. It's found in Germany in the 1930s. It is a lion man, a Lovenmensch. So it is the body of a man. Uh, with seven stripes down its left arm, which we think might be tattoos, and it has the head of a cave lion. Um, and this is dated to be around about 40,000 years. It is the earliest, or was the earliest piece of figurative art, art that we're aware of. And, and I should mention that the illustrations in the book are by Alice Roberts, who's a, an anthropologist and doctor in, in the UK, someone you might have heard of. Um, the point about this is that it demonstrates a load of characteristics in this one piece of art which are characteristics that we are very familiar with. This is what we might refer to as evidence for behavioral modernity, so minds like our own. It shows planning, it shows extreme skill. This cannot have existed on its own in isolation. It must be part of a series. It shows abstract thought. This is a chimera. This is an imagined beast. It must have had, it may have had, some sort of cultural significance for the people who, who carved it. We don't really know. But the point is that it represents something. It represents art. It represents something that is very familiar to us, but doesn't appear in the fossil record, in the archaeological record, before 40,000 years ago or so. Within a few thousand years of that, we have what's known as the Venus figurines, a set of small carved um, uh, female figures found around Europe. Uh, they often have exaggerated sexual characteristics, and for that reason, people have speculated that they might be sort of fertility charms or to do with reproduction. But the truth is that we don't know what they were for. Uh, it's difficult enough to imagine the mind of someone sitting in front of me right now, let alone someone who died 40,000 years ago. Uh, it, they may have been toys. They may have been dolls. They may have been pornography. We just don't know. But what we do know is that the fact that these are abstract figurative representations of the human form means that, again, these are minds that are not dissimilar from ours today. 
This one is the oldest. The Venus of Holyfells is about um, 39,000 years old. But within a few thousand years of that, we have the cave paintings in places like Lascaux in France. This is my favorite. This is 24,000 years old. Um, and this is a megaloceros. So it is a, a, an extinct uh, deer, great Irish elk. And, and there are hundreds of these. And we begin to see them not just in Europe, but all over the world. So we've, we've studied Europe the most because we've been looking since the 1920s, but the more we look, the more we find. And in fact, uh, here's uh, a cave painting from Sulawesi in Indonesia, again, about 38, 39,000 years ago. In fact, these are stencils, so these are, um, so it's red ochre that's been blown through hollowed out bones or sticks, and they're handprints, and there's about 14 handprints on here. And within a few thousand years of this, we see handprints all over the world. Um, I said that the, Lo the Lion Man, the Lovenmensch of Hollenstein Stadel, was the earliest. Well, that changed last year in all of my work, much to the frustration of my editor. I do have to update it uh, very close and sometimes after the deadline. Uh, and this was one that we snuck in at the last moment because this was published just in October. But this is a cave painting in Borneo. It's absolutely massive. It's on the, the roof of a huge cathedral-like cave in, in Borneo. And you can just make out that this is it's a banteng. So it's a type of indigenous cow. Two horns here, two front legs. There's a head and the tail at that end. Now, this was dated last year as being a, a minimum of 40,000 years old, which now makes that the oldest figurative art in the world and not the Lion Man only by a few thousand years, but the point is, it wasn't happening just in Europe at the same time, it was happening all over the world at the same time. Now, I've only been talking about Homo sapiens so far, but there's another, uh, which was only published last year, 2018, in February, and this is an enhanced image, because the original is, is more blurred than this. But this is from a cave in Cantabria in northern Spain, on the northern Spanish coast, and it is obviously abstract art. There's the front end of some sort of bovid here, a cow, maybe the back end there. And we don't know what the rest of the figures are. But again, it demonstrates abstraction of thoughts, some sort of behavioral modernity. And when it was dated in 2018, the date comes out as about 60 to 64,000 years ago, which means that it can't be Homo sapiens because there were no Homo sapiens in Europe at that time. It, the only people present at that time in Spain would have been Neanderthals. So this is all part of the revision of how we think about Neanderthals. For years, a century, we've been thinking about them as sort of, you know, grunting cave people, um, thuggish oafs. But in fact, they had all the aspects of culture that are indistinguishable from the way we think about ourselves through archaeological and prehistory. That date has been challenged, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, for the purposes of, of what we're talking about, it shows that there is behavioral modernity from at least 50,000 years ago all over the world. Now, we're in the art section. We have to think about what it takes to create that art. So but whilst in these sort of places we see abstract thought, abstract art, we also see lots of sophisticated tools. We see the beginnings of musical instruments found in, in Germany about uh, 35 to 40,000 years ago. So we have to think about us as tool users. So tools are one of the things, one of the three or four things that Darwin suggested were unique to humans our ability to use tools, to extend our physical forms by manipulating um, the natural world around us. And so this is a, a, an illustration of the earliest tools discovered with humans. It's found in Olduvai Gorge, which is in the Rift Valley, and is, so these were found in the 1960s by the Leakey family, who are the sort of primary um, paleoanthropologists in, in that part of the world. And they were dated alongside the remains of uh, a species discovered at the same time called Homo habilis. So this is Homo habilis. Homo habilis in Latin translates as handyman. Right? So this is a, the earliest member of the genus Homo, so the earliest human that we're aware of, and is defined by its tool use. The tool itself is made from obsidian, a kind of volcanic glass, but we see them all over the world over the next million and a half years from all sorts of um, igneous rocks that will chip and flake that could be napped into sharp edges. So Homo habilis did this one, but as ever in science, the more you look, the more you find. And in the 1990s, uh, a new species of hominid, not part of the family uh, of the genus Homo, called Kenyanthropus platyops, was found dating to around 3.1 million years ago, also alongside these same tools. So we have been what's known as obligate tool users, for at least a, a couple of million years before we were even Homo sapiens. And this is an extremely stable technology. So it's stable through time, 
for more than a million and a half years. It gets replaced by a more sophisticated type of tool, which is referred to as the Acheulean tool set. These tend to be bigger, more versatile, bifaced. You, there, there are sharpened ones, ones that are definitely sort of burins for carving in wood, ones for carving out some um, animal skins and things like that. Uh, these are stable through time as well for another million years or so. And so we've been obligate tool users for two, three million years. For more than 95% of that time, we've only used two, tools, two, two tool sets, the Acheulean and the older than chopper set. And within the last 100,000 years, and definitely within the last 50,000 years, we begin to see much more sophisticated tools. So the question becomes, well, is it just us? Are we the only uh, tool users? Well, you know the answer to that, because you watch nature documentaries. And we see amazing things like this orangutan that's uh, spearfishing, uh, which they do quite successfully. And in fact, loads of great apes, all the great apes, loads of other monkeys, also use tools in a fairly sophisticated way. What's interesting, though, is that if you look across the whole of the animal kingdom, about 1% of animals use tools, are obligate tool users. Their lives are dependent on using tools. Uh, and 1% doesn't sound like much. It's one in 100, but actually that's thousands of species. But the key thing is it ranges across taxa. It's not just mammals. It's not just primates. We see it in, well, you're probably aware of Caledonian crows and other corvids that are very sophisticated tool users. But we see it in mollusks, so the octopus um, uses tools. Um, as well as a whole bunch of other creatures. My personal favorite is, is this. This is, this is the boxer crab. It used to be called the boxer crab, but it picks up two anemones, stinging anemones, and holds them in its claws and um, uses it to fight other um, boxer crabs. Now, we call them boxer crabs because they box, but actually this is what they, they really look like. Um, so they get called pom-pom crabs. And, and I did think about putting, making the whole talk just pictures of, uh, of these because they're absolutely amazing. Now, one of the key things, this introduces one of the key things about our own tool use, which is different from um, uh, other animals, almost all other animals, which is the... I'm going to move off that because that's quite distracting, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, which is the mode of transmission of this information. So how do organisms learn to use tools? For almost all examples of tool use, it is innate. It is passed down vertically, meaning from parents to offspring, which means that it's genetically encoded. There are very few examples of what we do extremely naturally, what we're doing right now, which is communicating ideas to people who we are not related to. I don't think I'm related to you. Um, but we do it literally with every breath. Every time you speak to another human, you're sharing a unit of information. We are effectively, the way I frame it in the book, we are effectively a species of teacher. Teaching and learning are slightly different from each other, and there are lots of academic disputes about those definitions. Um, but the key thing is that we share information widely and in every direction, and the relatedness of the person or the people that you're teaching uh, bears no relation to, to the uh, efficiency of the information that you're actually transmitting. We are cultural transmitters. That's, that's what we are. Now, there are very few examples outside of humans who are cu cultural transmitters in, in the same way, but this is one. So these are bottlenose dolphins found in Shark Bay, been studied since the 1970s and 80s. Um, but in the 1980s, it was observed that a few of these dolphins were doing this peculiar behavior, which was to swim down to the bottom of the seafloor, find a conical-shaped sponge. Here's a photo of one of them and sort of work it onto their rostra, which is their beak, or their nose. And then they would go foraging with these sponges attached to their noses. So they're actually using it to protect their, their beaks from when they're scraping around the bottom of the sea, uh, in the rocky floor, or trying to eat crabs, or you know pom-pom crabs, and things with hard shells. And they're protecting their rostra from getting scratched up by doing that. So this is an you know, incredibly smart, and incredibly cool behavior. One animal using a second animal to hunt a third animal. Right? So that's amazing in itself. But then it was noticed in the 1990s that only a small subsection of these bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay were doing this, and it was only females. So this is a really weird phenomenon. Why would only the female dolphins be doing this? And they appeared to do it across all of the dolphins. All of the females were, were doing this, but not one male has ever been observed doing what we refer to as sponging. Um, we don't know why that is. We don't see any differential uh, reproductive success between the males and the females. Maybe the male dolphins are just idiots. I, I, I don't, we, we, we genuinely don't know. Uh, but when the genetics was done on the female sponging dolphins, 
a number of important things emerge from this. The first is that the, the range of, of dolphins doing this is they're not particularly closely related, right? So they appear to be learning this behavior from distantly related, and therefore it's being passed in a horizontal way as units of information. The second thing, which is really cool, is that we can tell the relatedness of the dolphins across the whole species, and knowing the generational time of a dolphin, which is roughly 25 years, we can track back through time and follow the pattern of how this behavior actually emerged. And what it means is that about six or seven generations ago, there was a single originator of this behavior who we refer to as sponging Eve, who was about in the middle of the 19th century, a female dolphin got up one morning and worked this sponge onto her beak. And from that point on, everyone copied. Now, that is one of the few examples of cultural transmission that we do naturally, that we do in every breath, in every lecture, in every talk, in every conversation, or in every schoolroom. Um, but it's very rare outside of humans. I want to talk about the dolphins. I want to introduce the dolphins because it, it introduces a concept which I don't think we talk about enough in evolutionary biology. So we, we uh, assume that evolution by natural selection is the, the best way to explain the diversity of life on Earth. But natural selection itself is not the only game in town. There's also sexual selection, which I've already mentioned I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but there's also this, this thing called drift, which is just a lot of characteristics just evolved because they're associated genetically with another behavior. Or it's just stuff that happened due to the happenstance of where you're evolving. Right? The location that you're evolved in. Here is a quote that I love from one of your presidents. Do what you can with what you have where you are. He's not talking about, Roosevelt's not talking about um, evolution there, but it's a perfect description of the cosmic happenstance of selection, of how, uh, how we evolve in our environment. And so we talk about dolphins as, in high school as one of the great examples of... Uh, how we can demonstrate that evolution is, 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 is a fact, which is that when we hold our hands up, we have all the bones in our hands, and we can do stuff like this, and dolphins have exactly the same bones in their front <coughs> fins. Absolutely match for match, they have the same bones. So we haven't had a common ancestor for uh, tens of millions of years, um, but they retain the same stamp of that shared evolution in their forelimbs as, as we do. But of course, we can do this, and type, and play the piano, and carve... Uh, Lowen mentions out of uh, mammoth tusks. And dolphins, in dolphins, they're all fused together. Those bones are fused together because they need those front limbs to swim very well. So what that means is that in that situation, dolphins will never evolve the ability to, you know, pitch a curveball or, or play a piano. Um, one of the second things that Darwin talked about as being unique to humans was fire. And I'm going to talk about fire now, but just before I get to it, Dolphins are never going to evolve the ability to create or manipulate fire because they live in the water. I didn't need to do that, did I? <laughs> but that inherently limits uh, the trajectory that they're on in terms of their sophistication. There isn't a direction to evolution, but they're never going to forge metal as a result of that. Now, we have been obligate fire users for a difficult amount of time to ass assess because fire in the archaeological record is not easy to, to assess. We know it's been around for at least two million years um, uh, it, by, by looking at um, uh, residues and in, in plains, and we know that uh, today forest fires and bushfires and savannah fires are annual occurrences within Africa and Australia and all over the world. So we have evolved alongside fire for a long time. The benefits of fire are in incredible and obvious, not just for warmth, but also we externalized a lot of our digestion by beginning to cook food. Now, you think about it, the more time you spend with your head in a carcass or on the ground eating, the more time you're risking being eaten by another creature. So if you can reduce the amount of time that you're grazing or eating, then that's an evolutionary, that's, that's something which can be selected by evolution. So if we externalize the, the digestion process by cooking food, making it softer and releasing some of the nutrients before it actually enters our mouth, then we massively reduce the amount of time that we're eating, which is why we think fire has become such an uh, a, a obligate a part of our own evolution. We are not the only animals that are reliant on fire. We know that chimpanzees in Fongoli and Senegal have very sophisticated appreciation of fire. They hang around near the annual forest fires, uh, savannah fires, until seconds after they've gone out and then will cruise in and they will pick out animals that have been cooked 
in the ashes. We know that vervet monkeys in South Africa do the same thing. And we also know that um, ungulates, so grazing animals, spend much more time grazing in areas that have been burnt down than they do if the grasses are high, simply because they can see further, which means that they're less likely to be predated. So we are obligate uh, fire users, pyrophilic apes. Um, lots of other animals are. From the archaeological record, uh, I mentioned that I've talked about stones, Neolithic, Paleolithic, Mesolithic. They mean old, middle, and uh, new stones. Uh, we, we define these eras by stones. We don't have a good record of what the stones were used to carve, right? Because um, biodegradable materials, they biodegrade. So we don't have many wooden tools. Uh, here's one example, though. This was dug up in Tuscany uh, a couple of years ago, 2018. Um, and it's boxwood, which is a very hard wood, and the, the ground that it was buried in it was, just happened to be very good for preserving the wood, so the biodegradation bio, uh, hasn't really occurred. It is a stick or a club. We're not entirely sure what it's for, but the important thing for this bit is that all of the twigs from the outside have been burnt off. So whoever did this had a controlled use of fire and was using fire as a tool. Now, this is about 120,000 years ago. The only people in Italy 120,000 years ago were Neanderthals. They were not us. So if we are a pyrophilic ape, then so are the Neanderthals as well. So we are dependent on fire. Other organisms through history have been dependent on fire. We are the only creature that is capable of starting new fires from scratch. At least that's what we thought until 2017. So this is a black kite. Uh, and this, this was a paper published in, at the end of 2017 in which it described something that Aboriginal Australians had known possibly for tens of thousands of years. But it was the observation that three species of raptor, so three birds of prey in Australia, in Western Australia, where they have annual savannah fires, were hanging around the edges of fires and then picking up a stick in their beaks or sometimes their talons and flying away over natural or man-made fire barriers and dropping them into dry areas of brush, starting a new fire, and then they go and sit in a tree. And as all of the critters, the small mammals and the lizards are being burnt to death, they run out to escape the fire into the waiting beaks of these birds. So they're actually chasing, they're using fire, starting new fires to chase out prey. This is what they look like in action. They do it in their thousands. So they, you know, these are birds that don't flock normally. But when they start a new fire, they absolutely just wait for that moving buffet. So we're now not the only animal to start fires, and I expect that number will go up. This isn't the same as being able to start a fire from scratch, but we're on different evolutionary trajectories from raptors. Nevertheless, it's just another example of how that pedestal of human uniqueness is slowly being eroded simply by looking harder. In this case, um, engaging with uh, indigenous expertise knowledge, uh, e uh, IEK is what it's, it's what it's known as. So it's not tools, it's not fire. So I'm not going to talk about sex. Maybe you want to ask me about that later. Um, but I want to get to this, the central idea of the book, which is it's not just the, cult, the idea of cultural transmission, how we transmit these ideas, these units of information through time. A new theory has emerged in the last few years, which has not been discussed in the popular press. And for reasons which I do go into in the book are, are not widely accepted, even though it's self-evidently correct. And it's got a dull name, it's called um, demographic transition, but it's the idea that it's not just how we culturally transmit ideas, it's that this is dependent on the size of our populations, and that when we see populations expand in the archaeological record to certain sizes, we see a sudden explosion in the evidence of behavioural modernity, of art, of sophisticated tools, of musical instruments, and all of those things which we think are symptomat symptomatic of our own brains today. And we see it all over the world. We see it in Africa, we see it in Europe, we see it in Southeast Asia and Indo Indonesia, happening at roughly the same time. So within the last 40,000 years, we see evidence that populations expanded. And with that population expansion, possibly to do with a changing climate, we see a sudden explosion in the, um, in the sophistication of tools and cultural artifacts in those locations. That's the archaeological evidence for it. This has only been studied really at UCL, where I'm based, and, and at Harvard. Um, but also mathematical models have been done where you input literally thousands of, of pieces of data and then see how effective the transmission of information is. So we think about, us, we think about this as units of information. I am passing on units of information 
to you right now. And it is dependent on the size of the population. So above a certain threshold, even incorrect and unoptimized transmission of information still happens at a much higher rate than below a certain population size. Now, that's, that's the key idea. Um, there's, there's evidence that it works in, in reverse as well. And, and let me just finish off by talking about fishing. So fishing is, we, we've been fisher, fishermen and fisher people for the last you know, more than a million years. Hooks are better technology than um, spears. And you see the, uh, the orangutans using in that earlier image are using spears. We now know that Caledonian crows actually do manage to carve, well, not carve, but they bend sticks into hooks when they're trying to get grubs out of bark. Because obviously, if you ask uh, uh, someone who fishes, you know, if, you, if you've got a hook, then the thing that you're catching is less likely to fall off than um, if you've got a straight spear. This is the earliest fishing hook that we're aware of so far. It's from uh, Java about 24,000 years ago. And it's the bottom of a conical uh, mollusk, so a, a shell. And it's just the bottom bit. And it's still sharp enough. The original is still sharp enough to cut your finger. So that's the first fishing hook. That's 24,000 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, we have these incredibly sophisticated pieces of fishing culture. So these are Magdalenian deer horn harpoons. And you can see how fine-toothed and sophisticated they are. Now, if we just think about the, the Australia and Tasmania. So Tasmania and Australia were connected until the end of the last ice age, about 11,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum. They were connected because the sea levels were lower and the sea level, because the sea was sucked into the glaciers that are a result of, of being in an ice age. But as the ice is melted, the sea level rises and Tasmania becomes separated from Australia for, well, for the next 11,000 years. Now, when, archaeolo when archaeologists look at the amount of tools that are in Australia before that separation and on Tasmania and compare it to the number of tools found uh, when European colonizers arrived in the 17th and 18th centuries, what you see is two very starkly different numbers. You see that there has been a, 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 a massive increase in the number of tools on mainland Australia and a massive decrease in the number of tools in Tasmania. Now, these are, I, I realize these are sort of culturally sensitive things to say, but I'm just dealing with the st straight numbers here. We also know that the um, indigenous people of Tasmania during that time stopped doing things like eating car cartilaginous fish. So we can see that from the bones in the archaeological record. We see the deeper you go, you have cartilaginous fish, and into the modern era, into the 17th century, they have none. They have returned to not fishing, but just foraging on the, on the uh, sea front. And to the extent that when European colonizers arrived, uh, indigenous Tasmanian people expressed horror that they, that they were out there fishing for cartilaginous fish. And so what we think has happened here is that the isolation, the lack of communication of ideas uh, of the people who were isolated on Tasmania meant that they slowly stopped developing new, culture, new, new cultural artifacts such as sophisticated fishing technology, whereas in mainland Australia, where they had lots of communication with the rest of Australia, those technologies continued to develop. So this is the key idea. So this is the key idea of the whole book, is that population size, our expanding populations are absolutely essential for doing what we do incredibly naturally, which is to communicate ideas, units of information um, in efficient ways. We are effectively uh, a species of, of teacher. There are a number of things which appear to be unique, different by degree and not kind is the phrase that Darwin used. And there are some things which are different by kind and not degree. And communication and speech is one of them, and maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. But the key idea is that it was through the expansion of our populations that we saw at a roughly the same time all over the planet uh, the emergence of the minds that we find recognizable as ours today. Now, I said it's a new theory. I said it's, it's a theory which really was only properly described in scientific literature in 2009. Of course, all the best stories in biology start with Darwin. And in The Descent of Man, he does in one paragraph say this, which I'll read. I'll update for 21st century humans. As humans, as humans advance in civilization and small tribes are united into large communities, the simplest reason will tell each individual that he or she ought to extend their social instincts and sympathies to all members of the same nation, though personally unknown to them. That really, in that one paragraph, absolutely encapsulates this central 
idea, which deserves much greater spread. It means it deserves to be discussed as widely as possible, because I think this is the root of our behavior as we recognize it today. We are, as I say, we are a species of teacher. I'll stop there, and so you can ask me some questions, but thank you for coming. Yes. So we're a species, a species of teacher because um, one of those long, um, um, what should we call it? Eve stuck her nose into a sponge. The dolphin. The dolphin. Oh yeah. Okay. So wait, let me phrase that again. <laughs> so we are a species of teachers because the dolphin stuck her nose into a sponge. No, I don't think so. So I think we. Oh. So so that is a. Uh, a, a unique example of something that we do very naturally but is not shared through evolution so that they have evolved that ability separately from us. We have acquired that ability over the last several million years but we've been, we're, we're long distance in terms of our relationship to our evolutionary relationship to dolphins. That, that, the dolphin I use is an example of one of the few examples of cultural transmission that we see in animals that are not us. It's not that we learn that from dolphins. Some researchers think that humans might have learnt um, fire behaviour in Australia, fire starting behaviour, from the fire hawks themselves. So that is, there's some indigenous Australians, Aboriginal Australians, describe these, um, these sorts of behaviours for much longer than, than, than the scientific literature, much, much longer than European science has described it. And they have suggested that maybe we learnt it off the birds. I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's a good story. Another question? Nobody asked about sex. <laughs> <laughs> or speech. So that's one of the things that I think is worth talking about a lot, is that we are really good at communications. All organisms communicate with each other um, out of necessity. But one thing that we do, and we are fundamentally wired, innately wired, for very complex grammar, speech, and syntax, you know this if you've got children, because children make daft errors in their, when they learn grammatical rules, which we, in English, have subsequently subverted. They'll say, I, you know, I swimmed instead of I swam. Um, in all the attempts to get other organisms to, to match our communication skills, they fall massively short. Last year, did you, were, you, were you aware of the gorilla who's known as Coco, who died last year? Uh, San Francisco Zoo, San Diego Zoo, one of the two. Coco had been trained to, to recognize more than a thousand words and sign them. And a lot was made of whether Coco was, you know, had speech in the same way that humans do. And I, I think Coco was an amazing animal, um, an amazing gorilla. But Coco never displayed any of the characteristics that a three year old does, which is to construct grammatical sentences, to, to reflect time in, uh, in their sentences. And of course, you know, that's a very artificial environment, whereas we just learn speech. All, all humans are programmed to speak very early on in their lives. Um, a, a gorilla in the wild would not do any of the things we don't think that Coco was trained to do after 30 years living in captivity. So I do think that communication, that speech, is, is a thing which is different by type rather than by, by degree. But again, I think it's predicated on... on the emergence of a mind that is capable, and, and, and a biological framework that is capable of, of delivering uh, that sort of complex neurological and muscular processing. I just, did, I just squeezed an extra 10 minutes out there, didn't I? Yeah. I'm curious, when uh, you talk about Australia and um, Tasmania, and when they uh, separated, um, what, were there actually any uh, written capabilities back then? Because I'm curious if there when, when they separated, essentially, if the reason why knowledge was lost is because there was nothing that could pass on that lineage. Yeah. It's a great question, and we don't really know the answer. So um, we only really see the earliest evidence of writing as we recognize it today about 6,000 years ago from Mesopotamia. Um, but obviously, any, any cave painting, any permanent marking is, an, is a, a way of transmitting a piece of information down the generations, whether it is just artistic or maybe informational. We and as I said at the beginning, we don't really know the purposes of these, these messages. We do know that Aboriginal Australians has lots of artefacts 
that display markings on stones and evidence of, you know, written isn't quite the right word, but, but um, daubed or painted or carved evidence of, of art or cultural artifacts. Again, we don't know what they mean. Um, but there isn't really any evidence that we can suggest robustly that this is the, this is the communication of a specific idea. And so with the, with the example of the fishing hooks, it, do, it doesn't l align with any of our, 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 our ideas of what information is being transmitted. But it is a, it's a key idea because we don't, um, you know, being able to record things is, is, is an essential part of being able to transmit information. Um, but it's very difficult to assess. Gentleman at the back with a hat. <clears throat> I'm curious, when a squirrel buries his uh, acorns for the winter time, is, is, or other animals do things like that, are they projecting? It's a great question. Um, so squirrels, is a good, if you didn't hear that, so when squirrels bury a thousand nuts, they can remember where 900 of them are, which is not something that I can do. Um, they, they, it is an extreme memory capability. They're not necessarily transmitting the information of where the, uh, where the information about the, the nuts actually is. Um, but the methods for actually knowing where the nuts are is done in a complex way to do with landmarks, to do with um, other things, which I can't remember because I'm not a squirrel biologist. <laughs> but... Uh, yes, they are capable of transmitting that information to others. In the same way that bees do, you might know that the bees do the waggle dance. So honeybees do a waggle dance, which they do a figure of eight dance. And the, the orientation of the axis of the eight uh, aligns with where good nectar or good water is. So they come back, they fly out, they come back, and they do a dance and sends the other bees in, in another direction. So in a sense, that is also cultural transmission of, of an idea. But it's not learnt behaviour. It's inherent. They, that, that's an innate, genetically encoded ability to do that from scratch. Yeah. So what are some examples of humans who have displayed these magical abilities? The ma which, which, what do you mean, the magical abilities? Um, so just like real life examples of humans who displayed these um, e extra evolved well, we all do it. So the point is that all of these things are things that everyone does. So abstraction of thought, creating art. There's another aspect to, to, which I didn't mention, but another aspect to this theory, which is that we are also a species of hugely uneven talents. So we are a species of experts, uh, because in no other organism do you see such uneven distribution of particular abilities. And in fact, you know, that, that is inherent to our... Our, our biology to our culture as well, which is that if you want to learn how to do something, you ask someone who knows how to do it. Now, we, we can see that emerging at this same sort of time. Not everyone was capable of carving the, the, the lion man or creating a flute or doing you know, whatever cultural thing is important at that time. So what we think, why we think the idea that you can communicate an idea, uh, communicate a, a unit of information, how to carve a flute, how to carve a lion man, is important is because not everyone could do it. And so what you see is the transmission of these ideas spreading through populations, and as a result, the population itself grows and is more successful. So I think one of the reasons this hasn't been discussed more is because it, it indicates something which we're groomed against thinking in evolutionary biology, which is group-level selection rather than individual gene-level selection, which is the, the, the selfish gene theory, which is basically correct. But I, I, that, that unevenness of talents is absolutely essential to, uh, to, to this as an idea. Wow, you've got a lot of questions. <laughs> should, should, we, should we just have, have one from this lady at the back first? Um, well, I've, I've read, uh, recently read um, The Human Age and Sapiens. I'm sorry, I can't remember the authors at this moment. I'm, beginning to truly enjoy your, your first book, Brief History of Mankind. But I wanted to say that um, the, the first two that I had read, The Human Age and Sapiens, they kind of close with, in, in our time, um, um, technology and, and kind of pontificate or kind of get fascinated with where, where will that go. Yeah. And when, when you talk about, um, I guess it's a, a typical question to ask in this day and age, but as 
transmitters of, of cultural information and as teachers, as, as a, a teaching species. Do you, could you kind of weigh in on technology? I mean, are we cynically like m more inefficient, like we're, in, we're efficient now at spreading misinformation or, you know I mean? Like, and also just as artifacts, like yeah. technology now, because we can transmit to across borders, how do you map something like that in the future in terms of tracing um, what our DNA evolves yeah. in thousands of years from now? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's another great question. Um, uh, this, I, I deal mostly in science and not in fortune telling, um, but which doesn't, doesn't negate the importance of asking this as a question. This, as an idea, really only works in our evolutionary history. I'm not sure it has anything to say about current... Our, the explosion in our ability to communicate with everyone on the planet in a single tweet, um, regardless of whether it's accurate or not. Um, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really comment on that. In terms of our engagement with technology, I think that is an important question, and I often get asked, you know, are we still evolving? Are we evolving in lieu of technology? How is technology changing us? Again, it's a very hard question to get scientifically right. It's a very easy question to get sort of culturally... Uh, speculate on and make all sorts of predictions which are unsupportable in, in scientific terms. But the fact of the matter is that we are, we are technological and we have been technological for three million years. Those, the, the, the old one chopper set, that is technology. Um, one percent of animals are te technological users. Now we have taken our technology to insane lengths, uh, in, in, insanely more sophisticated than any other organism. Is it affecting our evolution? Well, you know, there's two ways of answering that. Evolution just means change over time. And as long as we keep having children sexually, then, they, then we are evolving. The real question is, are we evolving under the auspices of natural selection? Now, that is a much harder question to answer. Um, and in some ways, we don't really talk about natural selection so much for modern human history. We talk about gene culture co-evolution. So our culture, meaning, you know, all, all, our archaeology, our technology, all of the things that surround our biology, which is our genetics, and that these two things work in tandem. So genes drive cultural changes, and cultural changes change our behavior, which then gets selected by, by nature. So it's all part of that integration that makes us both part of natural selection, part of evolution, but also distinct. There isn't another species that does the same sort of stuff as us. But again, I'm talking about within the last 10,000 years and not within the last century we see maybe some evidence of changing selection in uh, the Framingham Heart study in Massachusetts is one, one example. A study in Finland a couple of years ago which showed changing fr gene frequencies. Um, but it's really, really hard to assess, and you need to ask me again in about 10,000 years to give you a definitive answer, and I'll, I'll have an answer by then. <laughs> Quick question, are we the only species that is aware, self-aware, the only species that is aware of our own mortality, for example? Did you buy a ticket, or are you just asking that from, <laughs> from, from the edge? Um, I did not buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else want to ask the same question? No. Um, no, it's okay. You can buy a book. Um, uh, I, it's, a, it's a good question. And the, uh, well, no, is the simple answer. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's definitely not true for a number of reasons because, well, organisms have to be aware of themselves in certain degrees. We get, we get confused about the language. The language is quite, um, you know, we're limited by our own language. We talk about consciousness without really defining what consciousness is. And we say we have human-level consciousness. Well, tons of animals are con they have They obviously have to be conscious in order to survive. They have to be aware of themselves and aware of... Others. Some people talk about mourning, so being aware of one's own mortality as being a definitionally human characteristic. Well, we know that Neanderthals buried their dead, ritually buried their dead, so that's another human species. But there's some evidence, which I think is quite plausible, that elephants mourn their dead and other primates mourn their, mourn their dead. And, and maybe even dogs do. Um, so there's a, there's a test in psychology, it's been around since the 1970s, called the mirror test, um, which is to test self-awareness, to, to, to say, you know, are you aware when looking in a mirror that that is you and not another creature? 
or another member of the same species. Now, a lot has been made of this, and I think it has some validity. So a baby will learn how to... Well, if you put a dot on a baby's head and show it when it's six months old and, and hold it up to a mirror, it won't fix on the dot particularly. But when, when you do it when it's like 18 months old, it will recognise that it's its own head by looking in the mirror and try to touch it. Now, when we do that on other animals, you get a very... A, a few... A few animals seem to pass the mirror test. One elephant has done it. I mean, I don't mean one species. I mean, one elephant called Happy <laughs> has done it. Um, possibly dolphins have done it. But I, I, in the book, I'm pretty down on this as a test because I think it really overegs the significance of this particular test, which works for us. But B.F. Skinner, the famous psychologist, trained pigeons how to do it. So pigeons with two weeks training could pass the mirror test. Does that mean they're self-aware in the same, that we are, same way that we are? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but also, you know, it's a, it's an, it, I'm not sure it's a fair test. Because, like, gorillas make eye contact with each other. That is a sign of aggression. So you don't look a gorilla straight in the eye unless you want to retain your arms. Right? There aren't any mirrors in the wild. So what, why would they have evolved this, this ability? Dogs don't pass the, the, the mirror test. But then dogs' primary form of communication is through smell. And there isn't a smell mirror test that we've come up with. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthy question. Is, it, is, is, is this the thing? The problem is it's really, really hard to answer. And our best attempts at answering it so far, I, I think, have been some, some dubious science. I think I'm being told to stop now, aren't I? Have you ever you do this all night. What time is it? <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> Gene flows. <laughs> well, so, so, the, so gene flow events, so this idea that, um, uh, well, back on the slides when I showed that there was a gene flow events between Neanderthals and us. So that, that's happened at least twice. So at least, so we, we turned up and Neanderthals were around in Europe for, for hundreds of thousands of years before we arrived um, about uh, 50,000 years ago, 45,000 years ago. We overlap in time and space with Neanderthals for about 5,000 years. By 40,000 years ago, they're extinct and we're on the pathway to becoming what we are today. Now, because of the genetics, so there's, for 100 years, people were arguing about whether Neanderthals and us had interbred and coming up with no answers until we managed to get genomes out of Neanderthal bones and our own genomes and showed definitively that at least on two occasions there have been gene flow events. So population Y. A gene flow event doesn't mean like, one person having sex with another person. It means that there is a population in which there has been um, a flow of genetic information. And um, we, we see that in the Neanderthals, we see it in the Denisovans and, and the other uh, mystery human. Um, and we think, although again, this is very live science, it's being constantly revised, we think that um, the, 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 the introgression, the flow of, of Neanderthal genes into us, had a, a weakly negative effect meaning that it has been slowly being purged from our genomes over the last 50,000 years. But not so much that it still doesn't have enough, some impact. There, there's evidence that a particular gene um, that we inherited from Neanderthals predisposes us to di type 2 diabetes in one form and possibly nicotine addiction. And obviously, you know, Neanderthals didn't smoke, um, <laughs> but that particular version of the gene is associated with nicotine addiction when we did start smoking whenever that happened. Um, now, in t I get asked the question a lot about where, why Neanderthals went extinct and, and we didn't. And there's been a lot of speculation over the years about this. Did we hunt them? Possibly. Did we eat them? I don't know. I don't think so, but some people do. Um, we definitely had sex with them, um, and, and, but we don't know the nature of those sexual relations. We don't know whether they were, they were um, harmonious or not. Uh, but what we do know is that the Neanderthals were always a much smaller population than us. And so it may be that our success over the Neanderthals was were that we are just more efficient at reproducing. And that as because they had such small population sizes, that we just turned up and we overwhelmed them genetically. Um, if the question is, do we see that sort of behavior in other organisms? Well, yes, we do. We, d we definitely do. We see it uh, in 
closely related primates all over the world. So primates that are described as separate species, but when you look closely, actually they interbreed with each other all the time. We see it in a lot of birds. One of the great examples of natural selection having happened in the last, in, in, a, in living memory, is the European black cap, which is a, a bird that migrates from Spain to, um, to, well, it used to migrate from Spain to Germany, but during the 1960s, some birds got blown off course and started migrating to the UK, where in our gardens we have bird feeders. And because the journey to the UK is about a week shorter than to Germany, uh, they, the birds started doing this all the time. Now, we, we think we're seeing speciation happening. We, see, we think we see the European black cap becoming two different species of birds. The question is, do they still interbreed? We don't know the answer to that. I would be incredibly surprised if they didn't, if they, if they weren't capable of interbreeding. It's, this, this is an idea discussed in, in the last book, really, which is I, I have great animosity towards what Richard Dawkins calls, calls the, the, the tyranny of the discontinuous mind, that we obsessively put things in discrete boxes and try to label things in a way that does not reflect reality in the slightest bit. And it's all to do with Linnaeus, who is the father of nomenclature, um, uh, an 18th century Swedish creationist who came up with the rules that we still use to this day in terms of naming species, Homo sapiens, um, Homo neanderthalensis, Pongo pygmaeus. We still use that system. What he was trying to describe there was inviolate forms, sort of platonic forms of an organism. This is the platonic version of a duck. And what Darwin's genius was, was to recognize that, that biology is four-dimensional, is that we pass through time as, as well as through space, and that transition is continuous and normal, um, and that change is the default setting for all biology. We adapt to our current situation. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, why, um, that's why Charles Darwin was the, the most important thinker that we've ever had. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much.